a suit and a hearing was held on Wednesday where the judge said that he doesn't have the jurisdiction to be able to to rule in the case and so the blue book will be distributed without some very important information talking about how cannabis marijuana is self safer than alcohol um, and so it just feels like a dirty trick in my mind but um, that's the resolution of that unfortunate thing it just means that we're going to have to do a better job of educating people on um, the real pros and cons of amendment 64. Um, also in news this week um, a weird little article in the Denver Post and, and online saying 10 more letters, federal letters, were sent out to medical marijuana centers in Colorado telling them that they have 45 days from today to move because they are within 1,000 feet of schools. Um, don't know anything other than that. Don't know who they went to. Um, haven't gotten confirmation from any place. Um, so we'll keep you posted on that. Um, also locally in Colorado, our friend Senator King is back at it, thinking he is saving us from the perils of people who drive with five nanograms of THC in their system. Yes, the DUID five nanogram uh, issue will be in front of legislators again this year. Senator King has vowed to keep our our roads safe from these drivers. He has yet to talk about um, these dangerous drivers who have five nanograms in their system, um, nor has he given us any statistics, um, nor does he state that the current DUI um, legislation already talks about impaired drivers and that this doesn't change that. It only means that not that the police don't have to determine whether or not someone is impaired only if they have five nanograms or more THC per milliliter out in their blood. So that really sucks. I definitely have five. <clears throat> I definitely have more than five nanograms. Right. Well, any medical me. user who uses regularly probably more, does. Yeah. And it Even doesn't necessarily. If I probably sl didn't smoke for a couple of days, it'd probably still be up there. Well, and you know what? There's no there's no science to say what that would look like, and and certainly nobody wants impaired drivers on the road, no matter what you're impaired with. Um, mm -hmm. But let's let's have the law enforcement do their jobs and determine someone's impairment as opposed to just say, well, I'm going to pull you over. I have reason to suspect that you have marijuana in your system. I'm going to have a blood test. You tested positive. Um, you have five nanograms. You got a DUID. So that's pretty crappy. Um, Setting you up to fail pretty much. It, it really is. It really is. It's unfair to patients. It's, it's it. Yeah, it's, We'll see what happens. I mean, last last year, last le legislative session, people came out in um, in full support of of educating our our legislators on the issue. Um, but Senator King is um, balls to the wall, thinking that he's doing the right thing. So so we need some science out there. We need we need some studies, and right now that isn't the case. Um, next, uh, on a on a much happier note, on a much better note. Um, we have um, some fantastic studies out of um, Britain, of course, because we don't study cannabis here in the United States of America, um, that showed that um, some cannabinoids, specifically CBDV, in rats and mice afflicted with six types of epilepsy, a seizure disorder, found it quote, strongly suppressed seizures, end quote, without causing the uncontrollable shaking and other side effects of existing anti-epilepsy drugs. Um, that's pretty exciting that CBDV um, could also delay and reduce seizures used in conjunction with two common anticonvulsant drugs. So, um, you know, yet another wonderful, wonderful um, study showing that uh, the medical effects of cannabis and if we can continue to do studies, we can probably show all kinds of amazing properties that this plant has to offer. Um, and, and going along on another happy note, we are going to call Mark Sisti, um, who is an attorney out of New Hampshire, and talk to he and his client, Doug Darnell. Uh, as, we, as we talked about uh, on the Thursday night show on Overgrow, Mark Sisti received a wonderful verdict for his client, Doug Darnell, um, and he is a, a Rastafarian who uses cannabis in his daily religious practices, um, and 
and it's a pretty exciting, wonderful case and probably one of the best decisions in uh, um, marijuana verdicts in a while. So we will have Mark, the attorney, on the line in just a minute. We're calling New Hampshire. Hello. Uh, hi, is this Jane? Yeah. Hey, Jane, it's Georgia calling for Mark. You're live on the radio, by the way. Oh, geez, no. <laughs> <laughs> is your hubby, hey, well, is your hubby I'll around? Okay. What? I'll put Mark on. Thank he you. Has than I do. No, you're wonderful. Thank you. So a, a little, oh, I have an aunt in the studio. I'm not a nice person, though, so. Hi. Welcome to iCannabis Radio. Mark Sisti, how are you? I'm fine, and I'm watching, but not with no audio right now. Perfect, because there is about a 10-second delay. 10 seconds of that. So, so um, before we get started, are you, are you with Doug? Yeah, his last name is Daryl, not Darnell. Oh, Darryl. sorry, Daryl. Thank you so Doug. much. I apologize. Yeah. Um, and and Doug, Doug is here with us in the kitchen. And <laughs> Excellent. Um, Broncos game is on and uh, has has started, so I hope you're watching that as well. Um, yes, we have everything going. <laughs> so, so remind us. We talked to you um, a f- several months ago uh, about about Doug's case. Um, give our listeners a little recap of of what happened to Doug back in 2009. In 2009, um, a military helicopter came within 300 feet of his roof, circled around several times, and uh, took photographs of the area behind his home. Some of the photographs indicated that there were plants there. They um, got a search warrant and heroically arrived four days later with nine law enforcement personnel to search his property and pull up all of 15 plants that were approximately 8 inches high where the case started. So so what happens when when they pull up these these baby plants? What happens when they pull up the baby plants is that his wife says, of course those are baby plants, and that's what we use uh, here for our religion and for our medical purposes. And then they say, well, will Doug, you know, get back to us sometime today and speak to us? And he, of course, was out doing what he does for a living. That was tuning piano. And when he got the message, he did speak with the New Hampshire State Police and told them honestly and without any reservation that those were his plans and that he was using them for religious and medical purposes. And and how did law enforcement respond to that? You know, I, I, you know, honestly, I think they were dumbfounded. And, and frankly, the case should have never been brought to start with. It was, uh, in my estimation, about the stupidest case in the world in many ways. But in other ways, when you look at it, when you flip the coin, it probably was the best thing that's ever happened for the purposes of dealing with this ridiculous prohibition of a natural occurring plant. So, 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 can Doug hear me? Doug, are you on the phone? I can put Doug on the phone. Actually, that, that would be great. Okay. Good evening. Hi, Doug. Welcome to iCannabis Radio. Oh, good, good e- yes, thank you. Thank you so much for being on. So, so you heard Mark just kind of explain from, from an objective perspective what happened. From an emotional perspective, um, a military helicopter flies over your home. You're not there. Your your family's home. Um, what's what's going through your head when you get this call from your wife? Um, well, what actually happened? The military helicopter flew over on a Friday. Okay. And then um, we were out there having we were having lunch around one thirty in the afternoon, and we went out to look and see, and they did their little circling. And uh, I was looking at these guys, and I says, "Wow, these guys are real." These are guys are cowboys, man, the way they're flying around doing what they're doing. So I was, like, waving to them and just to know, tell them I, was, I knew they were there. And uh, so it was, like, four days later they came, and at that point I pretty much had forgotten all about it because um, 
you know, through my years of experience with the, the plant, the herbs, I mean, I just did this for what exactly what Mark said. It was for uh, basically my faith and for healing purposes. Uh, to take it, you know, to uh, sustain myself with all the things that we know now through the scientific research that are beneficial to us. So you didn't suspect that 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 that, that helicopter was there to to ultimately arrest you for for those plants. Um. Well, I knew they were doing something. I mean, I could tell from you know watching them because they weren't that far away. What was happening? They were doing something, looking through a box or something with a camera or something like that, but I just look at it as, as what's happening, and if, it, if they end up showing up, I would deal with it at the time that they would show up. And on that Tuesday that they came, I was out working, uh, talking to a woman up, in a, up where I am and uh, taking care of her piano and doing what I usually do. And when I got home and Gail told me, my wife, um, that they had been there, it was kind of a grave waves, you know, it's always, oh, oh boy, you know, sure. they, they came in here. And I had forgotten all about the, uh, the following the, the previous Friday because I was so busy with my other work that I do. So I just knew that at some point in time probably that I would have to uh, address this, you know, because it, more and more people, you know, this, this war or whatever. And uh, so there I was, uh, you know, having to deal with it. So you went voluntarily to law enforcement, because they asked you to, is that correct? Yes, well, I, had, I the, the state trooper that was there asked to have me call him when I got home, so I did. And uh, at first, uh, I had to leave a message, then he got back to me, and then we discussed um, the situation, and I asked him, well, what do you want me to do next? Do you want me to go to the station or whatever? And he said, no, we'll probably, we'll probably write an indictment up. And well, that's how it went. So at one point, did you think that you needed to get legal representation? Well, Mark has uh, been an old friend of mine, so the first thing I thought of was Mark. Sure. Because, you know, he, he's the guy. You know? He is the guy. That's, that's what we all say, absolutely. So he's, the, he's the lawyer that does this, and I knew very well his abilities to do, so I, I, I called him immediately. Okay, and... and we're going to we're going to fast forward a little bit. So so at what point did you get this indictment? Um it was about I would say a couple of weeks before the the indictment was actually written up and it was served. Uh cuz Mark was my representation in as attorney, he probably received those documents and those were forwarded to me through him. And what it, what were they alleging? Uh for manufacture of uh, marijuana. Okay. And and all of a sudden you realize this is serious. Uh, yes. I mean, you know, this is this is the process of law. I mean, I was standing in there for my rights. I believe that it was always my right to use the herbs, um, and that uh, if I didn't stand up for it, they would just they would have to strip this from me because in the Bill of Rights, I felt that I actually had the rights. So this is just the process in which we challenge um, the, the, the regulations that were created on, on this substance. And so we went forward and, and moved on it, and we went through a three-year, two-month process to finally come to a decision. So why did it take so long to ultimately get to a jury? Um, it, it's just the process here in New Hampshire between all the things with funding. I don't know if the law, the uh, court system is... is just slowed up. Uh, it was definitely slowed up to some degree because of cuts in the budget, and they had to shut down the courthouse like one day a week. Things like that. Things sure. that I would, you know, I don't, I don't understand exactly the inside of how the whole justice system works and how they fund it and how they work. But basically, that's about what I would see it. Sure. So, Doug, we're going to take a little break. We're going to keep you on the phone. We're going to take a quick commercial break and come back, and we're going to talk about um, about getting prepared for, for trial and then your trial experience. So if you can hold on just one second, we will be right back. We need to thank our sponsors at Lodo Urban Garden Supply, your uh source for all of your gardening needs, whether you are a hobby cultivationist or a 
a commercial grower, please go to Nodo Urban Garden Supply. That's N-O-D-O UrbanGardenSupply.com, located in downtown Denver at 1330 27th Street between Larimer and Walnut on 27th. Make sure that you tell them that you heard about them on iCannabis Radio, and they will be happy to help you with all of your gardening needs. Also, remember for all their customers, they have free, I said free, that's F-R-E-E, free, no cost, compost tea. Do you want some good nutrients, some stuff that's going to really help your plants and get rid of some of those uh, root bound issues and put some nutrients back in your plants, grab some compost tea, make sure that you ask the staff at Noda Urban Garden Supply exactly how you should apply it to your plants so they get what they need. Visit our friends at Noto Urban Garden Supply. They can help you out with all of your gardening needs. You're listening to iCannabis Radio and we'll be right back. The Law Offices of Vets and Maiden and Mats provide criminal defense, medical marijuana defense, and advice about setting up and running medical marijuana centers, optional premises, cultivation operations, and infused product manufacturing businesses throughout Colorado. With offices in Denver and Aspen, we can offer assistance throughout the entire state of Colorado. Give us a call at 303-831-8188. That's 303-831-8188. Or visit us online at warrenetson.com. Are you a runner? Are you a runner who supports marijuana legalization? Run on Grass is a group of athletes actively seeking to change our marijuana laws. We speak the truth about cannabis, bringing the message through our feet to new ears. Check out runongrass.com to find out more about us, our events, and how to join up or how to sponsor a runner. If you're in the Denver area, please join us for runs or start a group in your area. Running not your thing? Any sport can do it on grass. Runongrass.com. Let's face it, rules and regulations are complicated, especially in the field of medical marijuana. Let Medical Marijuana 101 help you get through the compliance process. We can also explain to you your employment requirements, your employees, and your business. But our work doesn't stop there. Our experience in cultivation ranges from the design of grow rooms to the diagnosis and resolution of grow problems. Visit us at www.medicalmarijuana101.com or call 303-831-8188. That's 303-831-8188. Are you a medical marijuana patient or interested in finding out how to become one? Contact Mile High Wellness, where your care is our concern. Conveniently located on Hamden and Tamarack in the Whole Foods parking lot behind Proof of the Pudding, Mile High Wellness offers a wide variety of edibles, hashes, and some of Colorado's top strains. Mile High Wellness, where your care is our concern. 3525 South Tamarack Suite 110 on the corner of Hamden and Tamarack. 720-382-8516. Mile High Wellness, where your care is our concern. Definitely visit our friends at Mile High Wellness. Doug, we are all back. Are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you so much for waiting. I apologize. Okay, so so it's 2009, and you have three years and two months um, before you go to court. What are some of the things that you and your attorney, Mark Sisti, are, are doing during that process? Um, well, basically, you know, you know, Mark's the attorney. He he looks at everything that attorneys look at, and he, you know, finds out from us, uh, you know, the usual things, just like what we've already discussed, and we just go along with the process. And, and other than that, it's just, um, a, you know, having faith to get through it all. And, you know, it's the old Chinese proverb, who has the most patience, you know, wins. Absolutely, absolutely. So if you wouldn't mind giving the phone over to Mark, we'll talk a little bit about the specifics of, of trial prep and then and then uh, sure. jury. Yes. Thank you so much. Hello. Hi, Mark. So so we um, we have traveled through time and we um, have traveled to, to through two years and uh, three years and two months, and uh, you are getting ready for trial. What are some of the, the things that are running through your mind in terms of what you need to do to make this um, a good jury for Doug? Um, you know, what are the kinds of things that you're doing to prepare? Well, the, every day, I have to tell you, is the longest period of time of my life for a couple of reasons. I'd say the number one reason is that Gail and Doug are our friends. Mm-hmm. But, which puts us in a very strange situation to start with. And uh, we wanted to be, you know, be as prepared as we could be and uh, ready as we could be uh, 
for this trial, and we knew it was going to be a trial because Doug was not going to plead to anything, whether it be a no-jail-time misdemeanor, uh, a violation, anything like that. I mean, we had to put our faith in the jury system, and uh, obviously it worked out, but we were angling for the jury nullification instruction, and we were trying to figure out just how we were going to get there. So can, let me stop you for just a second and, and talk a little bit about what jury nullification is. Well, it's actually it's something that actually came down years and years and years ago, and it's, um, its heritage, its legacy comes from uh, England, like a lot of things in this area in the United States. Um, you really can't question a jury verdict, and you can't punish a jury for their verdict. And that goes back to... 1278, actually, a long time ago. Yeah. And and we've used it in this country in many ways. And I have to be honest with you, in many ways it was good, and in many ways it was bad. And probably the best time period to explain what I just said was this, you know, the Civil War. And in, in, in that area, uh, 10 or 12 years uh, before the war and, and 10 or 12 years after the war. Ten or twelve years before the war, there were slaves that escaped from the South and came north, and they were property of people in the South, and they would have to, if they were captured, let's say in Massachusetts or New Hampshire, um, the individual would go on trial in the state of New Hampshire for basically harboring the property of another from another state. And the folks in Massachusetts and New Hampshire would find the people that would harbor those slaves not guilty. Now, it's not as though they were actually following the law because the slaves were property, just as though you stole a refrigerator from the South and brought it up north and kept it in your house. So nullification was good on that part, but nullification is bad, too, because if you go north and south and they lynched somebody or they killed a black man, a lot of white juries, and that's all they were down there, would acquit the white person that lynched or killed the black man. Right. And that was the implication, too. I think that we're dealing with a much more noble situation right now, and it's the kind of situation that took place in the 20s and 30s when we were dealing with alcohol prohibition, where juries just completely refused convict people for selling or distributing alcohol, just as though I think the tape, you know, I think the times are turning now where I think juries are going to wake up if they get the opportunity and stop convicting people that are growing, uh, you know, or cultivating marijuana for their own use or for the use of their friends or for whatever reason. It's actually quite silly and I've been doing this for 33 years, and I have to tell you, there's more use of marijuana now. The cannabis plant has been utilized more now than it was in the 70s, and the war, the so-called war, is absolutely absurd. That's right. Of a joke. So, so can any attorney request that a judge give jury nullification? Um, direction to the jury. How does that work? Well, actually, in New Hampshire, we're blessed. Uh, we have a history in this state, and I also practice in Vermont, where um, jury nullification has tremendous, deep, strong roots. And we have a case that came out in 1981, I believe it was, called State versus Wentworth that in many, many ways, in very subtle ways, allows defense attorneys to argue that even though the prosecution has proven their case beyond a reasonable doubt, you may still acquit if you think it is the right thing to do, the just thing to do, the conscientious thing to do. And it's, it's, it's been interpreted in a few other cases through the last few decades. And then we, uh, as a state, in July of this year, passed a law that goes into effect January 1st that not only gives us the right to argue jury nullification to the jury, but mandates in many ways 
the judge to give an instruction on jury nullification, which is so powerful and so much more than the hot wind of some impassioned defense attorney. Sure, sure. When, 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 a, when a judge gives that instruction, uh, as, as took place in this particular case, that is a very powerful tool. So what did the judge say to the jury uh, after you after you made your arguments? What did, well, let's uh, let's back up. Um, what what did the jury pres- or the um, court proceedings? What what did you do at trial? What did you say? What did 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 Doug get up and testify? How did that work? Yeah, sure. I mean, prior to the prior to the trial, we did an extensive. I think it was a three day suppression hearing with regard to the uh, search itself of this property, and that took place I don't know a year a year and a half ago. When we when we did that, and there was all kinds of photographic evidence. How close were they to the home? Uh, how dangerous was the uh, maneuver maneuvering they were doing? Uh, on and on and on. Quite frankly, it was a, I thought a very good issue that we had preserved for the Supreme Court if we had to, because the military helicopter, which is I think repulsive in many ways, a military ho- helicopter you know, circling a private citizen's home. For uh, for purposes of law enforcement, uh, was as close as 300 feet to the home. Wow. The FAA the FAA regulations uh, prohibit uh, uh, vehicles like helicopters and, and airplanes uh, from being within 500 feet. Wow! So it was an unreasonable uh, maneuver that was taking place to start with. But nonetheless, the same judge that ruled on the suppression hearing which was denied, by the way, was our trial judge. And in many ways, a lot of people were a little concerned about that. Sure. But he's a judge that I thought was probably the perfect judge for this particular case. So we only have a few more minutes. Um, when did, did Doug testify? Absolutely. And what did you have him testify about? Doug testified about who he is and what he is and, and what he does and why he, he grows cannabis on his property, why he uses it, what it does for him, what it does for his wife. His wife testified, discussed the medical benefits of it, uh, both testified to the religious use of it. And, uh, you know, it was a perfect example of why the jury system works. Yeah. Because we had we had a cross section of the community on um, this particular case. We didn't target anybody particularly. They were young and old. They were professionals and blue collar. I had a juror on there that apologized that he couldn't read too too good, as he <laughs> said, you know. And he was on. And then we had uh, we had an individual that was, uh, as she described herself, a self described elderly woman. I don't think she was that old. She was only a few years older than me. <laughs> But but uh, she was also the local librarian. Nice. And um, we kept her on the jury. And, you know, the funny thing is she was also a, what they call a free stater that came to New Hampshire. And uh, I would say that they're more of a libertarian bent uh, than most. But uh, she carried she carried the argument from what we could tell to the jury that, uh, why don't we just leave this guy alone and leave his family alone? I mean, they're, they're minding their own business, they're law-abiding citizens, and and we're, we're, we're here talking about convicting somebody for growing a plant. So how long so was I the... I thought we had a great jury and a great result, but uh, I, I would say a heroic client. Yeah. Because he was offered no jail time on a misdemeanor with no fine and no probe I mean, basically a walk-away ticket. I would say we had, believe it or not, a great judge that had uh, had the guts to give a jury nullification instruction for the first time in the state of New Hampshire. Wow. And a jury, and, and a jury that um, understood just what that instruction meant. Well, congratulations, not only to you, um, but to Doug, because you're right, it's it's heroic. It's one thing for you to do your job, Mark, and do an excellent job, um, you know, defending your client. Um, but, it, but it's quite another for, for Doug to, on behalf of all of us, defend 
doing the right thing and um, defend the fact that he's not a criminal and defend the fact that our ro- laws are wrong. Um, and you're right, he, he is a hero. Absolutely a hero. I agree. Let's see if Peyton Manning can pull it off. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Mark, for being on, and, and congratulations. What this is this is probably um, hands down the best decision that has come forward in, for the cannabis community in a really, really long time. And I am proud of you, and I'm proud of Doug, and and thank you both. Well, say hi to my man Gavin and I will. Warren. I will. Big hugs. Oh, say hi to Grace, too. (laughs) Yeah, I will. (laughs) I'll say hi to your daughter, (laughs) for sure. All right. Thank you so much. We've been talking to Mark Sisti and his client, Doug Daryl. Um, just a wonderful case out of New Hampshire. And, and, you know, I think it was really interesting. Mark gave uh, a good explanation of the positives and the challenges of jury nullification and how in this particular case, it was absolutely the right thing to do for the right reasons. Um, so, so thank you very much. Um, if you are interested in learning more about attorney Mark Sisti, um, please, feel free to Google him or go to his website, Attorney Mark Sisti. Um, We're going to take a quick break, and then we are going to call Toke at the Town's Steve Elliott to talk about Washington's uh, Initiative 502. But we're going to take a quick break first and thank our sponsors. Medical Marijuana of the Rockies, your mountain source for meds, located in Frisco, Colorado, off uh, highway I-70 exit 203 right behind the Big O Tires please visit their website mmrockies.com that's mmrockies.com they have their ever-changing strain selection as well as their immature plants that are available um, and it's a wonderful place please tell our friends Aaron and Jerry that you are listening to iCannabis Radio and you stopped in to see them Whether you're going up skiing because it snowed up in the mountains for the first time today, or whether you're leaf peeping a little bit, because believe it or not, despite the snow, there are still some beautiful fall foliage to to check out. Make sure you stop in Frisco, Colorado at Medical Marijuana of the Rockies. We will be right back. Are you a medical marijuana patient or interested in finding out how to become one? Contact Mile High Wellness, where your care is our concern. Conveniently located on Hamden and Tamarack in the Whole Foods parking lot behind Proof of the Pudding, Mile High Wellness offers a wide variety of edibles, hashes, and some of Colorado's top strains. Mile High Wellness, where your care is our concern. 3525 South Tamarack, Suite 110, on the corner of Hamden and Tamarack. 720-382-8516. Mile High Wellness, where your care is our concern. Hi, I'm Josh Stanley. And I'm Jesse Stanley. Two of the brothers here from National Geographic's American Weed. And we'd like to invite you to come into our dispensaries in Dispensary in Colorado Springs. Come in for the most pure organic strain selection in Colorado. It's all hand-grown by the Stanley Brothers, especially for our patients. So come in and visit us at our two locations, East Platte and West Colorado. And remember, always be kind to each other. Let's face it, rules and regulations are complicated, especially in the field of medical marijuana. Let Medical Marijuana 101 help you get through the compliance process. We can also explain to you your employment requirements, your employees, and your business. But our work doesn't stop there. Our experience in cultivation ranges from the design of grow rooms to the diagnosis and resolution of grow problems. Visit us at www.medicalmarijuana101.com or call 303-831-8188. That's 303-831-8188. Are you a runner? Are you a runner who supports marijuana legalization? Run on Grass is a group of athletes actively seeking to change our marijuana laws. We speak the truth about cannabis, bringing the message through our feet to new ears. Check out runongrass.com to find out more about us, our events, and how to join up or how to sponsor a runner. If you're in the Denver area, please join us for runs or start a group in your area. Running not your thing? Any sport can do it on grass. Runongrass.com. 
The law offices of Vets and Maintenance Mats provide criminal defense, medical marijuana defense, and advice about setting up and running medical marijuana centers, optional premises, cultivation operations, and infused product manufacturing businesses throughout Colorado. With offices in Denver and Aspen, we can offer assistance throughout the entire state of Colorado. Give us a call at 303-831-8188. That's 303-831-8188. Or visit us online at warrenetson.com. Welcome back. Welcome back. I am um, really excited. What a good show we've been having. Thank you so much for listening to iCannabis Radio, even if there is a big banner over my face, um, which should be gone soon, I'm sure. We are going to go ahead and give a ring to uh, Steve Elliott in Washington State of Toke of the Town fame, Village Voice Media. Um, I haven't talked to Steve in a long time, and I'm really excited to have him on the show. He's never been on our show before. And we're ringing, and we're ringing, and we're ringing. Hello? Hi, Steve. This is Georgia on iCannabis Radio. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you, Georgia? I'm so good. Thank you so much for being on tonight. I'm glad to be on. So I don't know if you were able to catch the first half of the show. We just had um, attorney Mark Sisti on and his client, uh, Doug Darrell, and they just had um, a manufacturing charge go to jury trial, and the jury came back um, not guilty based on the jury nullification instructions provided by the judge. So pre- I absolutely love when that happens, when a jury takes it upon themselves to uh, see that justice is done despite whatever the law may say. I agree. I agree. Pretty exciting case. Um, and uh, so we follow up with, with talking to you. And I have to, I have to confess something. So every Friday when you were on the John Doe radio show, I would always make sure that I listened because you have maybe the best radio voice. There's something about your Southern accent that makes me want to listen to everything you say. Well, that's great to hear. That's a nice thing to say. I really enjoyed doing the John Doe radio show, and I actually miss doing that. It it was a it was a fun few minutes for me every week. Well, I'm not sure it's gone. So so be sure to to get some time in your calendar because I think that that might be back and it might be back in the near future. That would be great if it is. That would make me happy. Absolutely, It'd make the rest of us pretty happy too. So um, what makes us not so happy <laughs> is, is talking a little bit about, um, about what's, what's going on in lots of different states, specifically your state of Washington, um, mm-hmm. and, and talking about the legalization measures. You know, um, I, I, I struggle and I, you know, I, would, I, all, I used to say, um, you know, it's really important to vote for any measure that is going to essentially legalize, decriminalize marijuana. I mean, that's, mm-hmm. that's the bottom line, and that's what we're all after. We're all after legalization. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it feels a lot like there are things thrown in to all of these measures to placate somebody or something. And, and 502 is no different. But before I, uh, we, we kind of go down that road, if you could just give a few of the the components of the measure so our listeners understand what 502 is really all about. Okay. Uh, In in my opinion, what has happened with 502 is they were so eager to get something passed that they could call legalization that they included too many concessions to the other side. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way I look at it, what we have is a measure that, that is a little too friendly to law enforcement and a little too unfriendly to particularly medical cannabis patients and uh, actually in general to the cannabis community at large. The biggest problem with 502, of course, is the arbitrary and unscientific DUI limit of 5 nanograms per milliliter, which is unsupported by science. The results on this, for any person willing to look at them objectively, are very mixed. You have a few studies indicating that uh, the level of impairment starts somewhere between 5 and 10 nanograms, but then you have just as many studies, just as valid, that show that there is no hard correlation between 5 nanograms and any impairment of driving ability. Mm -hmm. And in fact, 
among experienced users in many cases, and once again, this is uh, from scientific studies, many experienced users showed better driving abilities rather than impairment when they were at the level of uh, cannabis that they found personally comfortable. And that is usually over the artificial limit of 5 nanograms set in the Washington law. What our big fear is, uh, particularly in the medical community, is that patients who have to use large doses, and particularly those of us who have to address severe chronic pain issues, never drop below that 5 nanogram limit. And yes, I'm talking about active THC. Uh, they do at least in 502 differentiate between active THC and THC metabolite. Okay. But uh, even so, those of us who have to use heavily never drop below that 5 nanograms. We we'll wake up in the morning unimpaired, and we're over that 5 nanograms. So say we wake up in the morning and we start to work. And, you know, some fender bender or something happens, something you can't ever plan. Maybe somebody's talking on a cell phone and causes a, a wreck. But if that medical cannabis patient gets tested as a result of an accident, which wasn't necessarily his fault, then what's liable to happen is he shows up over five nanograms and he catches a DUI charge. And uh, those of us who have been through a DUI charge know that these things are no joke. They are very expensive. They can really mess you up. They can result in a loss of license. And after repeated uh, DUIs, they can uh, result in jail time, too. So I am very hesitant about any measure, whether you call it legalization or not, which, A, creates a new crime under Washington state law, and that is the crime being over 5 nanograms per milliliter while operating a motor vehicle. That crime isn't on the books right now. That creates a new crime and gives a new tool for law enforcement to arrest us. And at the same time, it isn't backed up by hard scientific data, which shows that we need something like this. Now, if we were seeing an epidemic of marijuana-related accidents right. on Washington's roads, I would uh, fully understand why people would want to have a DUI law like this. We're not seeing that epidemic. When we have a substance that actually impairs drivers dangerously, that becomes very obvious very quickly. I would point to alcohol. Everybody knows that it's very dumb to drink and drive and that if you do so very often, you're going to get either, you know, put in jail or possibly killed. That's right. We, we know this because it's so obvious that alcohol does indeed cause, cause impairment. Now, with marijuana, it's not so cut and dried. You don't have a real hard number. You know, you have 0.08 for alcohol. you above that, and you are under the law. You're considered impaired. Well, they're trying to do the same thing, of course, with that 5 nanograms, but it, it just doesn't work that way with marijuana because, as I mentioned, experienced users are able to drive just as well or even better in some cases, and, and patients, in many cases, if they are in severe pain or in severe nausea, then, of course, after they medicate and are no longer in that uh, debilitating pain and nausea, they're going to be able to drive better afterwards. That's and really uh, this, this law tries to take something that is complex and it tries to make it too simple. And it wouldn't be so bad if, in so doing, it didn't catch up a lot of unimpaired, innocent people in that net. And I hate to see people get busted when they haven't done anything wrong, particularly when they are among the most vulnerable in our population, the, uh, and under Washington's law, you have to have uh, a terminal or debilitating illness to get a medical marijuana card. So these are folks who are, are already having a struggle to begin with, and if they want to get out and, uh, you know, go buy their groceries or if they want to be a productive member of society and try to hold down some kind of a job, I think it would be a real shame to make that difficult or impossible for them by making them subject to these kinds of DUI arrests when they aren't even impaired. And what's your theory why people are willing to to forego the ability to potentially drive to have to have 502 pass? I think the thing is when something has that word legalization on it. I mean, I'm the same way and I had a real struggle with this Georgia before I was able to come to the position where I'm at now. I've spent my life basically 
since the age of 17 working for the legalization of marijuana. That's 35 years of work I put into this. Thank you, by the so way. Well, I can tell you, it, it gives me a strange, strange feeling to be advocating against any measure that's called legalization. But I, I guess with 502, they found out how bad one had to get before it crossed my personal line so that I couldn't support it anymore. And, and the thing is, it's not just me, but lots and lots of other patients, too, who see some real potential problems with this. Uh, of course, there are other things wrong with it besides the DUI provision, such as the fact that it still wouldn't allow uh, recreational growers or recreational users to grow their own cannabis at home. They would have to buy it from a state-licensed store, and uh, the cannabis would be produced by state-licensed growers. That, to me, is, uh, you know, it, it, it's unnecessary to put that kind of bureaucracy in cannabis when basically anybody should be able to grow a few plants for himself and be independent of uh, any sort of state control market if they choose to be. But is that a deal breaker for you, the no-grow clause? It would it would be a real struggle for me to get past that because to me it's not legal if you can't grow it. I, I as a young man, I, I came to learn the deep bond that you can have with your own strain, with your own plants if you grow them every year and, and take care of them basically from seed to flower. It's a different feeling than you get from anything else when you have that kind of relationship with a plant. And to take that away to me, uh, it, it is all but a deal breaker at the very least, and I would have to struggle and take a long time before I could support any bill which didn't allow home cultivation. The fact that it's also got that DUI thing in there, those two things together are just way out of my comfort zone, and that's the reason that I find myself in the odd position of opposing I five hundred two, I think I think for me, um, I I understand how how growers feel about the relationship that they have with their plants. I get that, um, and and while while that would be a concession, it's not harming people in the same way that the five nanogram limit is. I mean, that to me is harmful. One of one of the when I've been talking to people with this, one of the quotes I've been using is actually your quote, um, where you talked about. When people get a DUID, they're going to certainly wish that they um, instead had gotten um, a ticket for minor possession because the cost of a DUID is thousands of dollars versus the possession ticket that they would have had without 502. Um, that is an excellent point. Uh, when it's your point. <laughs> what, they're, uh, what they're proposing in this law is going to be more expensive and possibly have a greater legal impact on you than those possession charges that they're going to be getting rid of with uh, an ounce and under at least, then, then it makes you wonder what kind of progress are we making here. Well, yeah, it just, it just feels like it's that the five nanogram piece is, is so damaging. And I'm sure you're aware that, that in Colorado, we have in the past two legislative sessions fought against uh, the DUID bill that contains five nanograms in Colorado, and it's going to be up again in January, and we're going to have to fight again this legislative session. And, and the, the legislator, uh, Senator King, who is sponsoring the bill, believes that he is is saving people from the dangerous drivers that are out there hurting people. And we just don't know where those drivers are. I want to be saved from those drivers as well, but I'd like evidence that they exist. Right. We keep hearing about these dangerous stone drivers. And, uh, you know, to me, they're, they're kind of like Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> Everybody claims they must be out there somewhere, but nobody's seen one. Sure. Um, and I, I think that it, it makes it even worse with the DUI portion that for Young people, 21 and under, in other words, those of us who have been impacted possibly the most unfairly of any demographic group by the marijuana laws, they've set a zero tolerance level for DUI for under 21. So if you measure any amount of THC in your bloodstream, uh, you are guilty of DUI under this law. Impaired or not. So these, these are, are young people who... You know, they're going to be saddled with this DUI for no telling how long, and it's going to be expensive, and it's going to clog up the court system if this law is applied as written. And I, for one, uh, I tend to believe that if you write a law and if the, you give law enforcement these tools by which to arrest people, they are going to use it. I, I'm not of the school of thought that trust them. Well, they're not really going to enforce it. I, I don't, you know, if you don't want them to enforce it, don't pass the law. 
I've also heard that go ahead and get things passed because you can always change the law later on. How often do you think that happens? Well, as far as DUI laws, I'm not personally aware of any DUI law ever being relaxed, ever, right. anywhere. Uh, you know, who wants to be the legislator who is known as the guy who wanted to loosen up the DUI laws? Nobody is going to, to step on that political third rail. If anybody tried, you know, once this thing is passed and we have these DUI limits in place, that's going to be the status quo. And, and some guy comes along and says, wait a minute, this isn't supported by science. What are we doing here? Immediately, what's going to happen is he's going to be branded as the guy who wants to let people drive stone. Right. And, uh, you know, that's not going to have anything to do with the facts. And all he was trying to do was point out that people are getting arrested for DUI when they aren't impaired. But that's, uh, that's why that it's going to be very difficult to get it changed. And also under Washington state law, you can't change a voter-approved initiative for two years. So we're stuck with whatever's in the language for the first two years. And that's time enough for plenty of people to catch those DUI charges before we can change anything. Absolutely. So uh, what does your crystal ball say is going to happen in November? I am a realist. So I see a poll that says 57% say yes on 502, and that's the latest number I've seen. Wow. To me, if, if it's over 55% in September, it's going to pass in November. Okay. So, yeah, do you, uh, DUI and the other, the cultivation prohibition in 502 is bad. However, I think the fact that even with this flawed initiative that you're seeing this level of support bespeaks the enormous public support that the idea of cannabis legalization has uh, among the public now. You can only imagine if this were a better measure, uh, the kind of support it would be getting from me and a lot of other people in the community. The fact that it still is polling this high, even with the problems it has, shows the strength of the idea. It's an idea whose time has come, that it really is time to legalize marijuana. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, thank you so much for, for your insight and your opinion. I appreciate it tremendously. And I hope that you will be on our show again um, to talk about I'd all like kinds of issues. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. We've been talking to Steve Elliott, Toke of the Town. Um, and Ev, as I've said before, one of my favorite people. I used to say in the chat room all the time that I kind of have a crush on that voice. Um, so, Steve, thank you. <laughs> That's good to hear. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying that because Warren's not on the show tonight. So, so I feel like I can say that. Steve, thank you so much. And we will talk to you soon. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Georgia. I'll be looking forward to next time. Absolutely. Absolutely. What a show, guys. What a show. It's been, uh, it's been amazing. We have some exciting things going on. You know, speaking of polling, 502, it's polling at 57%. And um, Amendment 64 in Colorado, the, the only initiative to make it on the ballot this year, um, is polling over 50% as well. One of the things that's a little bit unnerving is the last time that there was a legalization amendment that uh, up in front of Colorado voters, it pulled also over 50% in September, but by the time November rolled around, it did not pass. So we need to get people to really be knowledgeable about what they are voting on and make sure that they understand what can happen. I think that um, I think that Steve makes, I mean, he always makes some really good points, but I think one of the things that, that he really points out is that while there are things that he feels like are deal breakers in 502, um, that the support to that initiative really speaks to where we've come and how people are are really believing that that prohibition it needs to end. I mean that's evidenced in in um, Doug Darrell's case with Mark Sisti in New Hampshire that a man growing 15 plants in his yard for he and his wife for their medical and religious purposes while illegal in New Hampshire they should not be charged with a crime shows again where people are that prohibition has um, has done its time and and we should now be freed of that. So so get out and vote folks. Make sure you know what you're voting for and make sure you know what your legislators are voting for and what they believe and don't vote for people who don't believe in what you believe in and and you know when when the legislative session comes up in Colorado um, if you do not want to see the DUID bill passed you need to 
email and call your legislators. You need to show up at the Capitol. You need to be able to talk about the fact that there is no science that shows that five nanograms is the magic number. That, that you are automatically impaired if you have five nanograms of THC in your blood. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's not enough to say that somebody else will show up. Um, legislators listen to the people who speak the loudest in, in whatever fashion that they speak, whether they are giving them money, doing fundraisers, whether they are calling them frequently, um, any of those kinds of things. And so so please play a very active role. Um, this is going to be an interesting month of November, and I kind of wish it was over, but that's just me. Um, we have an exciting week on iCannabis Radio Tomorrow night, we'll have uh, our friends, American Weed Realm Radio. They always have a great show, uh, Alan Shackelford and the folks from Can Labs. Sex Pot Radio, Wednesday night is, of course, iDab Radio. And Thursday, did you catch our new show? How was the new show on Thursday? Good show. Good show. show. THC guys are awesome. Absolutely. The Hemp Connoisseur is doing their uh, video magazine every Thursday from 4 to 5. So that's a little bit of a time difference for us. We are branching out into... um, Sort of the drive time. So if you can listen to us uh, at the end of your work day, and uh, that's a great way to start. And then, of course, after that is Overgrow the Radio from 7 to 9. Next week on Monday is uh, we had a little bit of a switch. Greg Dower, who normally does his history lesson this week, is going to be doing it next week. So our cannabis history lesson. And of course, your grow tips from John will be on the show as well. So don't miss that. Uh, Don't forget to go visit our sponsors, Mile High Wellness, Noto Urban Garden Supply, Edson Maintenance Mats, Medical Marijuana of the Rockies, Medical Marijuana 101, Run on Grass. And of course, go visit our really good friends at MMD of Colorado at 26th and Walnut. I'm Georgia. That's Chris. That's Sam. It's iCannabis Radio. Have a good night. Bye. You want to play it? Yeah. Let's face it, rules and regulations are complicated, especially in the field of medical marijuana. Let Medical Marijuana 101 help you get through the compliance process. We can also explain to you your employment requirements, your employees, and your business. But our work doesn't stop there. Our experience in cultivation ranges from the design of grow rooms to the diagnosis and resolution of grow problems. Visit us at www.medicalmarijuana101.com or call 303-831-8188. That's 303-831-8188. Are you a runner? Are you a runner who supports marijuana legalization? Run on Grass is a group of athletes actively seeking to change our marijuana laws. We speak the truth about cannabis, bringing the message through our feet to new ears. Check out runongrass.com to find out more about us, our events, and how to join up or how to sponsor a runner. If you're in the Denver area, please join us for runs or start a group in your area. Running not your thing? Any sport can do it on grass. Runongrass.com. The Law Offices of Edson Maiden and Mats provide criminal defense, medical marijuana defense, and advice about setting up and running medical marijuana centers, optional premises, cultivation operations, and infused product manufacturing businesses throughout Colorado. With offices in Denver and Aspen, we can offer assistance throughout the entire state of Colorado. Give us a call at 303-831-8188. That's 303-831-8188. Or visit us online at warrenedson.com. Are you a medical marijuana patient or interested in finding out how to become one, contact Mile High Wellness, where your care is our concern. Conveniently located on Hamden and Tamarack in the Whole Foods parking lot behind Proof of the Pudding, Mile High Wellness offers a wide variety of edibles, hashes, and some of Colorado's top strains. Mile High Wellness, where your care is our concern. 3525 South Tamarack Suite 110 on the corner of Hamden and Tamarack. 720-382-8516. Mile High Wellness, where your care is our concern. Hi, I'm Josh Stanley. And I'm Jesse Stanley. Two of the brothers here from National Geographic's American Weed. And we'd like to invite you to come into our dispensaries in Dispensary in Colorado Springs. Come in for the most pure organic strain selection in Colorado. It's all hand-grown by the Stanley brothers, especially for our patients. So come in and visit us at our two locations, East Platte and West Colorado. And remember, always be kind to each other.